OK, so last time we talked about how spin-orbit coupling, the coupling between the magnetic dipole of the electron spinning, and then the, it's spinning in its orbital, can lead to changes in intensity and band shape. So that's one of the mechanisms by which we could see technically forbidden transitions. So another mechanism that uh, changes intensity as well as band shape is vibrotic coupling. So vibrotic coupling is coupling between vibrational and electronic uh, wave functions. And then so um, we talked before about how the electronic going from uh, different orbitals has your transition dipole moment operator, and the vibrational does not. So uh, for example, one way this affects our spectra is if we think about intensity. We said that for transition metal complexes, are going from a G-symmetry orbital, which is all the D orbitals, to another G-symmetry orbital. This is parity forbidden. Um, and then this is also known as the Laporte rule, which is that you can't go from G to the G because the transition dipole moment operator operates as U and then G. And so this is because G times U times G does not equal G, right? This equals U. So um, one way that we, but we still can see DD transitions, even though they're technically Laporte forbidden. Um, so one mechanism by which that happens is through vibronic coupling. So if it couples to a U vibration, we have an, let's, let's say an unsymmetric vibration. So then we can see, uh, then we get intensity from that through this coupling. So coupling to a U symmetry vibration that we can get intensity. And then one, of the, one way you can tell that this is, uh, if it's vibronic coupling, is, is temperature dependent. So temperature will change which um, vibrational modes that we're at, V equals zero, or sorry, the vibrational like, levels, like nu equals zero, nu equals one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that would change the amount of coupling we get. Another way that the vibronic coupling changes our spectra is it could also change our band shape. So this is the one we'll talk about mostly for this lecture. So for let's say we have our ground state. And in our ground state of our molecule, the ground state electronic state, so let's say we have for a D2 molecule, we have two electrons in the T2G. So it's like that would be the triplet. I forget what the, I forget what the ground state is the term, but a triplet state that's a ground state. So here's our ground state. But within the ground state, we can still vibrate. So because of that, so here's our ground state. So this is our ground state energy curve. And then this x-axis here would be like how much we're vibrating. Right? So this is kind of like our delta r. And then again, this y-axis is energy. This is our ground state. And then so again, we have kind of like our vibrational things. right? So nu equals 0, nu equals 1, nu equals 2, et cetera, et cetera. So that's our ground state. And then we'll have our excited state. So suppose we're exciting one electron from our T2G orbitals to the anti-binding EG orbitals, we're going to get some nuclear motion in the excited state. So excited state will have longer metal ligand bonds because we're populating the sigma star orbitals. So it's going to be maybe broader out here. So there's some kind of change, a nuclear displacement upon excitation. So here's our ex excited state one. So uh, let's say that this is our triplet ground state. This will be our triplet excited state. So, um, and then this one also has different vibrational levels. So when we do our excitation, so for the absorption, um, keep in mind there is the, the frank condon principle. Which is basically that like electrons, uh, electronic motion is really fast, and it's going to move faster than our nuclear motion. Makes sense. Electrons are small. So when we do our excitation, the arrows basically, in principle, for this type of diagram, the arrows have to go straight up. We can't have electronic motion. And so right, the x-axis is nuclear motion, and then the y-axis would be electronic electrons going up in energy. So they have to go straight up because um, we can't have nuclear motion first. So we here's our kind of, let's say we start at the, the nu equals 0. So we can go straight up, but we'll, we just have to see like where we can go straight up at. So 
This one can go here, going straight up. And then we can go here, here, here. So, oh, and then also here. So basically, it's the one where the, there's like the greatest intensity of this wave function. So you see, if this one was, this was like a Gaussian, right? Kind of like this. So basically, then we, that ends up dictating kind of our band shape. So we we'll end up with the band shape that it can access all these different vibrational levels. The one with the greatest overlap is going to be the most intense. So it's going to be looking like kind of like this. And then also it can go up to higher levels. So, so therefore, in principle, you could resolve each of these transitions. And then this, the difference in energy will be the difference between your vibrational levels for these, these guys. So this kind of like delta E will be how much they're split by. Um, <coughs> So, and then uh, the, as a result of this, so this kind of band shape is going to be dictated by how much this excited state is displaced in the nuclear way from the ground state. So, if you have less displacement, and again, this is between the ground state and the excited state you're going to, then you might get some, um, your, if it's directly on top, you'll probably go your maximum will be nu zero to nu zero of the ground state, excited state. And then you'll end up with a more kind of asymmetric curve. And that's because, so this lowest vibrational level is going to be the, the most intense if there's the greatest overlap. So your shape will end up looking like this, the lowest energy kind of like that. Um, if you have more displacement, which is kind of like the image that we drew, up here, and this might be like a more Gaussian type shape. And so this is the typical band shape that you might see where you have a lot of displacement. So then if you can't resolve the fine structure of the vibronic coupling, you end up with kind of a broad thing that looks like that. So that's why sometimes we see broad Gaussian-like bands because of this coupling as well, as well as spin orbit coupling and other factors. Um, yeah, and then so one reason why in the spin flip transition we see sharper bands is because um, the spin flip doesn't do a nuclear motion. We're not populating to antibody orbitals, so this is closer overlap. And then so we'll get more asymmetric, sharper bands. So, um, and then a key point about vibronic coupling is um, often you can't resolve this, so you get the broad band. But if, the, if the, it's the case for kind of your band shape, then you should have temperature dependence. And that's because <clears throat> in this picture, we drew all the excitations from this new equals zero state of the vibrational level of the ground state. But at high temperatures, as we kind of go up in temperature, we can access these uh, nu equals one, nu equals two of our ground state term. And then so that kind of, again, will um, lead to less resolved bands because then we can also get to excitation from nu equals one up to excited state as well. So as you go down in temperature, we'll, uh, we'll selectively occupy only this nu equals zero state. Because we go lower in temperature, we can't thermally excite our electrons or excite, excite our wave functions to these other higher vibrational modes. And then so then we'll get, uh, usually you'll get better resolution of your peaks and also a change in band shape. So uh, key point, vib vibronic coupling is temperature dependent. Um, oh, and then for the intensity, this is also temperature dependent. So as you uh, go up in temperature, um, you're going to then see uh, maybe like kind of changes in intensity of your bands as well. OK, great. So that's kind of the, the major factors that result in band shape and changes in intensity. So that's why electron exposure spectroscopy isn't always uh, necessarily as straightforward as just reading one signal at a time. We've got splitting, we can get different band shapes, we can get broadening, or we can get sharpening uh, changes in intensity as things couple. So there's rather a lot of complicated things going on. <laughs>